My granddad came from Guangdong, which is a province in southern China. When he was young, Chinese men wore a very long braid. Another name for the braid was a queue. That's a hard word to spell, but an easy one to say. It is pronounced just like the letter Q. I don't understand why either. When I was little, one long braid at the back of the head was called a pigtail, though I'm sure a pig's tail never got as long as my granddad's. Granddad arrived in New Zealand in his Chinese-style clothes and with his long queue. It reached all the way down to his waist. He was very proud of his queue because he believed it made him strong and wise. He came on the same ship as another young man, a cousin from his village in China. Their uncle had come to New Zealand many years earlier to look for gold in Otago. The Chinese called New Zealand the New Gold Mountain. But the gold ran out and the uncle wanted to see some of his own family again. He moved to Wellington and sent for his nephews. Everything was strange in Wellington. The people were bigger, they spoke loudly, they smelt different. Some had eyes as blue as a summer's sky, some had frizzy hair as orange as carrots, and some had yellow hair, the colour of straw. Grandad had heard in China that white people looked different. Their skin was as pale as a dead person. They looked like ghosts. But what Grandad did not know was how the white people would feel about him. He was going to find out. At that time in China, families grew all their own food. As the sons got married and had children, more and more people had to live off the same piece of land. Soon, there was not enough land to grow enough food for all the people. The eldest son usually got the biggest piece of land from his father because he was first married. There was never enough land for the families of the second and third sons. They left China to work overseas. They sent money home to help their families out. They always hoped to return home with enough money to buy some land of their own. This was wishful thinking because there was no spare land for sale. That is why my granddad came to New Zealand. There was a poll tax that Chinese had to pay to get into New Zealand. The poll tax was like a very expensive movie ticket. Grandad's uncle had loaned the money to him. This was a lot of money, and my granddad would have to work very hard for a very long time to pay his uncle back. But what kind of work was he going to do? In China... He was a gardener, so he knew a lot about fruit and vegetables. He used to take the extra vegetables to market where he sold them. Then he could buy salt and cloth for the family. He could do the same thing in New Zealand. Grandad and his cousin used the last of their savings to buy coolie poles. These were long wooden poles which they balanced across their shoulders. A large basket hung at the end of each pole. Grandad and his cousin would go to the vegetable market, load the basket with fruit and veggies, then carry them out to the streets to sell. They were called hawkers. They could carry very heavy loads with their coolie poles. Grandad and his cousin would take the fruit and veggies to the houses where the mothers would buy them. Apples and onions were favourites. Sometimes the mothers didn't have the right money or they were waiting for their husbands to be paid, so Grandad would let them pay the next time. The mothers were always amazed that the two Chinese men knew exactly how much they owed from one week to the next because they never seemed to write anything down. What the white people did not know was that Grandad and his cousin 
would write what was owed in very small Chinese letters on the bottom of the gate or on the planks of the fence. No one but Chinese could read the notes. Some of the poorer white people were very glad to have credit, th that is, being allowed to pay later, because they had children to feed. On one house, Grandad had written what they owed on the bottom of a plank in a wooden fence. Imagine his surprise when he came back one week later to find that the owner had painted the fence white and covered over Grandad's numbers. It was the only time Grandad could not collect what was owing to him. The mother just thought he was being extra generous by not charging for last week's veggies. But Grandad did not want word getting around the white people in case they all decided to paint their fences. <laughs> At the end of their visit to the houses, if there was anything left over, Grandad and his cousin would go to the docks to sell it. On one particular day, the two Chinese men had gone to the docks with extra fruit in a basket. They had left their coolie poles in a room. A group of dock workers, each one a big strong white man, had stopped for lunch. They bought apples from Grandad and his cousin, and all but one paid for their fruit. When they asked to be paid, the man refused and called them nasty names, especially about being Chinese. He said they were dirty and dishonest and swore at them. Grandad wanted to leave. After all, it was only one apple, but his cousin refused. He asked again for payment. By this time, the dock worker was getting annoyed. He was angry that the small Chinese man had challenged him and front of his friends. He was going to teach him a lesson. He stood up with his fists clenched. Grandad and his cousin knew he wanted to beat them up, so they dropped the basket and started running. Cheered on by the other dock workers, the man ran after the two Chinese. They were agile, but the man had a long stride. He caught Grandad's cousin by the queue, flying out behind him. He gave the cousin two black eyes, a broken nose and a split lip, while all Grandad could do was watch. Back at their room, Grandad had cleaned up the wounds on his cousin. He took his scissors and cut off his queue. Then he cut off his cousin's cue. They promised each other that they would never grow another one until they went home. Grandad packed his cue in a box and sent it back to his wife in China. That's why Grandad cut off his cue, so that it could not be used against him. He dressed in European clothes and never grew the cue back again. He told me that sometimes a person must make sacrifices to survive in a foreign land.